tuned in to the right place on this Sunday morning, and uh, we thank God for you. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the inner working of the Holy Spirit, and so the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, faith, wind, and fire, and so this is kind of a, a, kind of a continuation of it, but we're going to talk today about the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to ask you to turn over to John chapter 16. This is where we will begin today. You guys there? All right, I still hear pages that are turning. We don't want to leave anybody behind. You know that Jesus doesn't want to leave anybody behind. You know that. This is why God has given us such a commission to share his word with others. So that no man, no woman, no boy or girl has any excuse. And this is our call, you know, in these days. So today, as we talk about the inner working of the Holy Spirit... We're going to see, explore a little bit more of the, the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives and, and what he does on the inside. And you and I know that salvation is an inside job. And so um, in John chapter 16, it says this beginning in verse 7. Jesus is speaking here. And uh, these words that he is speaking are some of the last things that he is speaking to his disciples before he is going to the cross. And he says this in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, capital C, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And then he says this. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So we're going to stop right there. And so Jesus begins to share some things that the Holy Spirit will do. And he, you know, previously in some of the uh, chapters leading up to this, he laid out, he began to lay out some of the things that the Holy Spirit would do. And, and he was prepping them for the time when he would not uh, be with them as he was in that form. And now he would be coming to them by way of the Holy Spirit, just as he comes to us by way of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus lays out three specific things that the Holy Spirit will do. Now, I remember back when I was a young teenager and I was, you know, seeking after a greater uh, a dimension of the Lord in my life. And and um, I wanted to grow in certain things, and I was hungry. You know, how many of you know that you have to be hungry? You know, it doesn't really benefit you. It doesn't cause you to really uh, go forward the way that you need to if you're not hungry. There has to be a pursuit. And so I remember pursuing after the Lord. And, um, and you know, of course, we uh, begin to find out about the the, the dynamic working of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all of that, as I explained, uh, you know, a couple of weeks prior. But there is a greater place that the Holy Spirit wants to take us to in our walk with the Lord and that God wants us to go to. And the Holy Spirit, is he plays a vital role in our lives in these days and, and the things that we do and that we are to accomplish in the kingdom of God in the church in these days. And so Jesus is laying out three specific things that the Holy Spirit will do. And this is very critical and very important in understanding what the Holy Spirit does as we go out and we preach the word to people that do not know Jesus. As we talk about Jesus to others, as the word is communicated, as, as we lay out the instructions of the word and as we go forth even in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus laid out three specific things that are important for us to know in these uh, couple of verses. And so one word that we're going to look at, uh, I will say a little bit more uh, uh, in detail today, is the word reprove. Jesus mentioned this word here. 
Reprove is a word that is kind of like um, a double-edged sword or you could say a double-headed coin. One side of it is to expose, to cross-examine as a lawbreaker in a court of law. Um, the word uh, cuts through to convict. This is where there's been such evidence that has been laid out that now the word of God, in this case, is able to penetrate the heart of the person that it is being spoken to. So this word reprove, on one side of it, it has to do with conviction. If you think about somebody, a lawyer that is laying out all of the facts in a court of law to convict someone of a particular crime that they are being accused of. And so you guys have seen all the court shows and you've seen Law and Order and all of these things. You've seen all of this, this stuff and all of the drama that's been associated with all of those things. Some of you have seen Perry Mason, all of those different shows. Matlock, okay? Some of you older generations, you know? So, you know, you've seen all of these cases in court where all of the evidence is laid out. And, and the evidence is laid out in, in, from one attorney to prove or to convict someone of a crime, all right? And then on the other side of it, it is to, uh, to defend someone, okay? But all of the evidence is laid out. And so let's look at the, the person that is trying to be convicted. And so we see all of the facts, all of the documentations are presented in such a manner that is compelling to the jury and to the, the judge and so forth and to everybody else that is there that this person is guilty of that crime that they are being accused of. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, see, the Bible says this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the fact remains also is that not all see that they have fallen short of the glory of God and have offended God. Not everybody has seen that. Not everybody has understood that what I have done has been offensive to God. What I have said and what, how I conducted myself was grievous to God. Not everybody has understood that the way that I'm living is going to cause me to go to hell. And so now it takes the Holy Spirit coming in, that when the word is preached, that the Holy Spirit comes in and he convicts the sinner and lets them know that, that you are a sinner. And the only way that a sinner will identify and turn away from that sin is by recognizing or being convicted that I am a sinner. And if I continue on this path, that it's going to lead to my destruction. And so this is the first role that the Holy Spirit plays. And so as, you know, all of us that have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you remember back to that day when you got convicted. Somebody preached a word to you, or maybe it was through a church service or through, you know, some televangelist or whether it was somebody in your family that, that, that talked to you about the Lord. But in some way, shape, or form, there was a conviction that it just got to you on the inside. You know what I'm talking about? It got to you on the inside, and you said, you know what? You're right. I need to change. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He comes and he brings conviction. Without that the sinner will always think that what I'm doing is okay, and they will be blindly being led. And this is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 4, I think it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, yes, it says this, that uh, verse 3 and verse 4, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So we're talking about the man, the woman, the boy, and the girl that does not know Jesus. That may be you out there, you that are watching, okay? It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the little G God, if you notice it says there, little G God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So there is one that is out there that is intentionally causing blinders to be placed on the eyes of those that have not heard about Jesus or have not accepted Jesus. So there are certain blinders that are being put there or that have been put there to prevent them from seeing the truth of the word of God that they may be saved. And so it says uh, these blinders are put there by this little G God of the world 
And it says, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. So we see that there is an intentional and a deliberate blinding or blinders that are placed there so that a person will not see. All right? And so one of the clues of these blinders that is put there, the Bible says this. It says that all that is in the world is this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and another lust, <laughs> uh, the pride of life. It says this is all that is in the world. One clue that we have in um, Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Moses. It says that Moses being in Egypt, even though he was, you know, he was a son of, of, of Pharaoh, of Pharaoh's daughter, even though he grew up in Egypt, it says, yet he considered the pleasures of sin. Okay? And this is where... This is what causes blinders to be there sometimes with people is because of the pleasures of sin. Moses understood that the pleasures of sin is for a season. Now, don't kid yourself. Sin is pleasurable. Okay? And so somebody says, oh, sin is not pleasurable. Well, you just, you're, you're just in denial. Okay? And you're lying. Okay? Because there is a certain pleasure that sin does have. Okay? If it wasn't, then we would have been born saints. Okay? We wouldn't have grown up as, you know, sinners and had to, you know, get converted. Okay, so there is some pleasure that is in sin, all right? But the Bible says after that season, okay, because it is only for a season, however long that season lasts, and that's the deception of sin. And so that is a part of the contributing factor to the blinders being placed there because it feels so good. It looks so good. It's so appealing to the senses. You know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It's something that is desirable, and, you know, for, you know, it looks good. And so Moses accounted it. He says, the pleasure of this sin, and he understood it was a pleasure to this sin. He grew up in Egypt. He had the best of the best, all right? You guys seen coming to America, all right? He woke up in the morning. <laughs> I mean, he didn't have to do anything. All right. He had the best of the best. And so Moses grew up in Egypt, but he said the pleasures of this sin. Let's turn there. Let's, let's look at it real quick. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's see. Hebrews 11. Let's see. Verse uh, 20. Let's start at verse 24. Let's start at 24. You guys there? It says, by faith. See, this is how you have to do it because, you know, what's presented and what appeals to you may not, um, you're going to have to step out away from, you know, those things. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. See, this was a choice that he made. He made a quality decision based on Something here. He says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, he understood. He, he saw a spiritual value that this is fleeting. It, it feels good and it looks good and it's pleasurable for a moment or for a season. But he says, he says, rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. You have to understand when it talks about these treasures, this was the most prominent nation of the earth during that time. This was the number one nation in the earth at that time. So this was not some third world country that he was, you know, you know a prince of. This was the best of the best. And it says that he looked at the pleasures of all of the the sin that was there, and it says he accounted it as not worthy of suffering with God's or being a part of the suffering of God's people. And so oftentimes the pleasures or the, the desire for the pleasures of sin, it allows blinders to be there that the enemy can place there for someone to be kept there in that position. And then this is where the work of the Holy Spirit comes in to come in there and when those blinders aren't there, then a person can really see. And it says this about Moses. It says, um, 
And um, I'm trying to find it. It says, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, and by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So he wasn't so, his, his eyes weren't so caught up on the pleasures of the sin that were before him. And, and that, so there was no scales, there were no blinders that was there, but he saw something, it says that he saw him who was invisible. So he saw something of greater value, he saw something that was seen by the Holy Spirit enabling him to see something that was greater than the pleasures of sin that he would experience at those moments. And so this is um, a part of the work of the Holy Spirit. There is an enemy that comes to blind our eyes, okay, and those that are out in the world. And sometimes he tries to prevent us from seeing some of the things that God has for us. And so uh, the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, so that the sinner man or woman knows that they are in sin. But then the other side of it is that the Holy Spirit comes to convince. So he convicts of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. But the other side of that word reprove also means that he convinces of righteousness. So when it talks about he, con he convicts the world of sin and of righteousness, how many of you when you first got born again, you still thought you were just a sinner and you were unworthy and all of those other things that, you know, you were grown up and you were to believe and so forth. And so now the Holy Spirit comes along. You got born again. You accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now the Holy Spirit has to convince you that you are the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And so the same Holy Spirit that convicted you to say, hey, you need to turn your life around. You need to repent. You need to have a change of heart. Now the same Holy Spirit has a job to convince you that you are a son of God, that you are a daughter of the Most High God, that you are the righteousness of God, that you are healed by his stripes. The same Holy Spirit now has to convince you that you're not poor anymore, okay? The same Holy Spirit has to convince you of righteousness. Jesus said, turn it back over to John chapter 16. See, he's still in the court of law. And he has to convince now. And this is now where everybody has to understand. See, we got away from, we understood the part where he convicted you of sin. And the Holy Spirit still convicts us of sin if we do something wrong, if we, uh, we do something that grieves the Lord and so forth. And, um, and, and the Holy Spirit will uh, reprimand us. He'll speak to us in regards to those things. But also a part of his job is not just to convict us about sin when we've done something wrong. His job also is to convince us of righteousness. Jesus said, of righteousness because I go unto my father. Well, what does that mean when he went unto his father? That means that he presented his blood on the highest throne in, or the highest uh, seat or the altar in heaven. And so that is the representative of the place of the completed work. And so the, the, the cross was the altar on the earth. The, the altar, the golden altar in heaven is where Jesus presented his blood before the Father and the Holy of Holies in heaven. And so the finished work, as Jesus said, of righteousness because I go unto my Father. So he presented everything there and he sat down at the right hand of God because the work is finished. And so of righteousness now because we have a new standing position that we also have to understand. So the Holy Spirit... As Jesus said, he will, uh, he will remind you of things that I've spoken to you. This is what Jesus told his disciples. All of the stuff that Jesus was telling them that they didn't quite grasp and understand at the time. He said, the Holy Spirit will remind you of those things and he'll show you of things to come. He'll teach you. He'll help you to understand all of the things that I am about to do. And so when Jesus sat down at the right hand and he completed the work, now the Holy Spirit helps us to understand he convinces us that, hey, you're not poor anymore, so stop thinking that way. You know, now the Holy Spirit, and this is why renewing our mind is so important. So now when we hear the word of God, now the Holy Spirit comes in and he now reveals the truth of God's word to us so that it, we get to a place where we're convinced. Okay? Sometimes we're not convinced when we hear the word the first time about something. And this is why we have to progressively hear the word so that faith comes and the Holy Spirit can now convince us, finally, that all of those times you heard this, this is, you finally got it. 
And so the Holy Spirit comes to not just convict us when we've done wrong, but to convince you this is who you are. This is who you are. And then of, of judgment, because he says that the prince of this world is already judged. We have a defeated foe, and he's not above us, but he is beneath us. So the Holy Spirit comes to convince us. He lays out all of the truths, all of the facts to help us to understand that this is what Jesus has done. This is who you are in Christ Jesus, and this is what the devil is, okay? And so the Holy Spirit convinces us of all of those things. You guys follow me? Okay, so this is a part of the, the inner workings of the Holy Spirit that is continuing and continuously happening every time you hear the Word of God, every time you think about the Word of God, you meditate on it, and so on. The Holy Spirit is there to convince. If you're in sin, if you, you do something that's wrong, he's going to tell you about it, okay? Uh, privately, he'll tell, you know, there are different means that God deals with, uh, deals with us about things, but he's also there to convince you, to help you to understand everything that Jesus did. Uh, I'm going to list uh, a bunch of things here that you can write down. I'm going to list them uh, kind of quickly, what the Holy Spirit does, and this is not all of them. Uh, one, the Holy Spirit comforts us. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 18, it talks about uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit being the comforter, okay? So he is a comforter. So he's there when, you know, Jesus said another comforter, one that's just like me, one that's, that's going to provide some consolation that sometimes when you need it. One that is going to be a, 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 a lawyer in the courtroom when you need it. One that is going to be there for whatever it is that you need. He is a comforter. All right? So he is a comforter. The, uh, it says in John chapter 14, verse 17, that the Holy Spirit will dwell in us. So he's not just around us. He's not just with us. He, he's for us but he's also in us. So John chapter 14, verse 17. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 26 says that the Holy Spirit teaches us. So he is the great teacher. He, he reveals the word to us. He lays it out and he breaks it down so that we can understand it. There's something specific about each of our learning. All of you, you know, as you know, those of you that are teachers, you understand that different students learn in different ways. And the Holy Spirit is a great teacher, and he understands all of your life's experiences, and he relates the truth of God's words to you in such a way that you as an individual understand it, and we as a body of Christ collectively will understand it. And this is how dynamic he is in his teaching. So some of you, even as I'm, I'm teaching right now, the Holy Spirit is breaking down things in different ways to you because all of us are on different learning levels. All of us are on different places in life. All of us have had different experiences. And the Holy Spirit has seen it and been there with you in all of it. And he's breaking down things as you're hearing it so that you'll grasp it in a way that you can understand it and apply it to your life. Isn't he good? Okay. And so the Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit reminds us. So, and that's also in John 14, 26. So there, when you're hearing the word on Sundays, Wednesdays, or you go back and you, you listen to it, or when you read the word, or you heard something that your mama said, something apostle said, or something that some other man or woman of God said, or just something that the Holy Spirit spoke through some other person that he wanted to speak something into your life that he could use later, whatever the case is, the Holy Spirit will remind you of whatever it is that you need. And I don't care what it is, if you need it, okay? Some of you study for stuff in school. I'm talking about young students and adults, okay? The Holy Spirit will remind you of something that you heard and that you need to apply at that specific moment. The Holy Spirit will remind you of something that your mama said that you know you needed to hear. You could be getting ready to do something, and all of a sudden you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You think it was your mama. You thought it was Apostle Rock. You thought it was some other person, but it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you through that voice that was in your life. So the Holy Spirit will remind you. He will remind you. I've heard my parents' voices of many days, okay? He will remind you, and they weren't there with me, Okay? So he will remind you of, of things that you have heard when you need it at that moment. The Holy Spirit testifies to us and through us about Jesus. John chapter 15, verse 26. So he testifies. See, he speaks about Jesus. 
He opens up everything that Jesus has done and what he has accomplished through his, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit reveals those things. He, he, he bears witness. That's what he does. He testifies just like in a court of law. Okay, You have a witness that testifies to the truth. Okay, uh, And so the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, he cannot lie. Whatever he speaks is truth. And so he testifies of the truth. And he does that to us. He does that for us. And he will do that through us as well, to others. Okay? So this is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, um, as we talked about in John 16, 9, he can, convicts us of sin. Um, also in John 16, 10, he convinces us of righteousness, as we already talked about. Okay, um, the Holy Spirit guides us, John 16, 13. Even as Romans 8, 14 says, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So the Holy Spirit guides us. He will guide you every day in the little and in the great. And so it's important to begin to recognize and understand his voice as he speaks to you. Because there are a lot of voices out there. Okay, I'm going to say that again. There are a lot of voices out there. And as you heard apostles say, too many voices, too many what? Too many choices, okay? So the apostle Paul said there are many spirits that have gone out into the world. So that means there are many things that are speaking in these days that you and I live in. And some of them are angels that have transformed themselves or demonic spirits or devils that have transformed themselves as angels of light. So they're speaking to you certain facts and certain things Okay, and, and you may think it's truth, but guess what? Hmm, it's not. It's a deception, a form of deception. And so you have to make sure you can recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. All right. And so, but the Holy Spirit, he does uh, guide us. Uh, John 16, 13 also says that the Holy Spirit reveals unto us. So this is a crucial thing right here. And this is a a thing that separates just reading the Word of God and, and understanding the, the facts that the Word says. You know, some people read the Bible just like it's a history book, okay? And it is full of history, all right? It's full of His story, okay? But it, it, it's not just a historical document. And so the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus said, that, that the church is built on revelation knowledge, and the Holy Spirit is who plays that part in revealing the truths of God's word to us. You can look at the word on the surface and it can say one thing. And then so you'll, you'll see it, again, based on maybe your experiences or your level of understanding of the word of God. In the same scripture, Apostle Rock will look at it and the Holy Spirit is laying down a whole nother root system that's going into that same verse. And so there's so many different things that the Holy Spirit will reveal as you spend time. This is what I have learned. And this is why I said earlier at the beginning, the importance of hunger, the importance of being willing to spend the time to dig deep. You know, I remember, you know, uh, and you've heard me say this before, before I even knew it was in the Bible, the Lord said to draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So in other words, what he was telling me, and this was when I was a teenager and I, you know, again, I was, I was so hungry, and I still am. And this is a thing that will separate you. If you're a young person and you, you want to experience the presence of God, you want to experience a deeper uh, level of God in your life, you have to be hungry. You, 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 there has to be a certain drive and a pursuit in you to want more. And I remember, you know, the Lord said that to me, and I was like, okay. And then one day I found out when I was reading the Bible that that was a scripture in James 4, 8, Draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. And so there has to be a pursuit, a, 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 an intentional and a deliberate uh, step towards God. Um, and, and, and what happens is as, God, as you do that, God begins to reveal more and more of himself to you. All right, Just as Jesus had the 70, he had the 12, and then he had the 3. And, and so based on... How you draw near to him determines the things that become revealed to you. And so your pursuit is a very key thing in that, 
in, in that role and receiving those things in your life. And so the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you. And, and I have found, and, you know, and have continued to find that the more I pursue, the more he begins to open up things. And I've been serving God since I've been, a, you know, a young man, a young child, okay? But the, the, the things that I receive and understand now are built on the things that I learned then, but there's so many more things that he's revealing that I'm like, you know, just, you know, sometimes wrapping my mind around. And, and, you know, and so I know that as you continue to pursue, the Holy Spirit reveals deeper and deeper things. And I know that we have only just scratched the surface of it. There's so much more depth. You know, sometimes we, again, we, we get happy with the kiddie pool, okay, because we're experiencing a certain part of it. And it looks good, okay. We go to church and we're experiencing certain aspects of it, but God wants us to dig deeper, right? Okay, haven't you heard that before a few times? <laughs> All right, to dig deeper. And so the Holy Spirit has so much more that he wants to reveal, but it's by the Holy Spirit that we receive revealed knowledge. And these are the strategic, uh, tactical things that will help us to advance as a church in these days. And this is why Jesus said, the gates of hell. See, there are all kinds of plots. There are all kinds of strategies. There are all kinds of tactics that hell devises against the church, against you as a family, as an individual, against, you know, the, the, the things that we see going on in the world. These are demonic strategies that we see that are coming to pass. But the Bible says, as Jesus said, the gates of hell... The places where the decisions are made, as we understand that in years past, as Apostle taught, the gates of the city are where the places where the elders met and where, you know, laws were passed, decisions were made, and so on. And so Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Why? Because of revelation knowledge. Not just the things that we read on the surface, that's just the beginning, but the things that the Holy Spirit reveals to the church, all right? And so um, the Holy Spirit reveals. Um, Jesus said in, in uh, John chapter 16, verse 14, the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. So he will take of what Jesus has presented and, and everything that Jesus has received of the Father, and he will glorify Jesus. And so everything gets pointed back to Jesus. And just as our lives should be, you know, our lives should be pointed back to Jesus. So the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. Um, and, and, and what he does is he takes everything that Jesus has done, and he puts it on full display, and, and, and the honor and the glory goes back to him. And, and he, he takes of everything that is Jesus, and he shows it unto us. He, he lets us know. Again, he's, he's testifying of everything that Jesus has done to convince us to convince us that this is who you are and this is what you have. See, it's at that place, you know, of when we begin to get or go deeper, this is where we begin to really see our secret, as I call it, our secret identity. That's, where it's, that's the place of where it's revealed. See, there, there are things that are hidden even about us there are things that are hidden about you that you will not discover until you get to that place of, of a deeper place in your relationship with God. There are certain things that God will show you. There are certain clues that, you know, uh, breadcrumbs that God will leave along the way to get you to, you know, begin to take the bait, to understand this is the direction that you should be going in. But then when you begin to get into a deeper place of your relationship with him, then he begins to open up more things to you, and this is where your life really begins. This is where you get from the place of, of, of mistaken identity to understanding who you are. And this is why so many young people out there today don't know who they are, and they're trying to become so many different things. They're trying to become a binary code or some other jazz that, you know, that's, you know, put out there. They're not a he or a she. They're some code or binary, you know, formula, whatever it is, you know. You know, that's, that's, you know, what some of them are saying. This is what some people are influential in our society are saying, that, you know, they're this or that. You know, so it's, you know, if you understand, if you get to that place, 
God will reveal to you who you are and open it up to you, you know, of, of the journey of your life. And this is why I encourage you, get to that place and God will open those things up to you. He will take of what Jesus has and what he has accomplished. He is the yes and the amen. He is the beginning and the end. All of our lives are all wrapped up in him. And so he will reveal those things to us as we get to that place in him, okay? And so um, the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, helps our weaknesses. So there are things that sometimes there are struggles in our lives. And it says in Romans 8, 26, that the Holy Spirit will help our weaknesses. It says in the King James, our infirmities. So he will help our weaknesses, whether it's, you know, things of the flesh you're dealing with, whether it's even physical ailments or whatever the case is, whatever it is, even if it's something mental or emotional, okay? Whatever the case is, how many of you know weaknesses is weaknesses? He didn't specify a, a particular thing. He just generalized it and let you know, letting us know that he will help us with all of them, amen? And so it says the Holy Spirit will help us with our weaknesses. Let's turn over to that. Let's look at it real quick. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, as it says in the King James, or weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself, see, in other words, you know, sometimes we don't know what to pray for. We don't see and understand everything that's going on in the Spirit or behind the scenes or whatever, but the Holy Spirit sees and he knows. And so it says, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit uh, himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit knows, and, and, and this is why us being filled with the Holy Spirit and praying in other tongues is so important because when we begin to do that, we begin to, uh, the Holy Spirit sees and he understands and then there's an intercession that begins to take place. Also, when your life begins to deviate away or the enemy's trying to get a person's life off course and they may not even be aware of it, it may be trying to bring somebody into their life or some situation, or whatever the case is, the Holy Spirit sees and knows and the Holy Spirit, because God already has already written certain things about us as far as our lives and what we are to do and accomplish and so forth and everything. And, and so when we begin to pray in the spirit, there's also a recalibration that begins to take place, okay, in the spirit. This is what it says here. It says, the spirit knows or it helps our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. The spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then it says, he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So God already knows what his will is for your life, what his purpose is for your life. He knows, of course, what his word in general says, but in that word in general is also a specific word about each of us, okay? And so um, the Holy Spirit reveals those things and he helps our lives to stay on course with God's word and with his purpose and his counsel. And then this is why it says in verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So God makes sure through our prayer and intercession that it helps our lives to stay on course with God's purpose for our lives. And this is what the Holy Spirit does as well. I remember hearing this, and I think I shared this before. There was a, a young man who ended up doing something in, um, with, in politics and, and he asked the Lord because he said he, he, couldn't, he couldn't stand politics and being a part of it or anything. You know, he just, he just, you know, disdained it. And so he asked the Lord, how did I get to this place in politics? And he said, all those times when you were praying in the spirit, because that was what God had for him to do. And he said he thought he was just praying over, you know, so God could help him in his finances or some other situation that was going on in his life. But it was... God was calibrating his life according to the things that God wanted him to do at such a point in time. And so when we pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit knows what God's intent is for your life. He knows what God's intent is for uh, the church, and this is why we should pray in the Spirit 
you know, and not, you know, we pray with our understanding, but we pray with our understanding after God has revealed to us by us praying in the spirit, okay? And if, you're, if you want to do your prayers to be more effective, then you pray in the spirit and God will begin to show you what is going on, what you need to deal with in the spirit, and then you can speak to things with your natural tongue because now it has been revealed to you. You understand? And so when we pray, God's counsel begins to come into your prayer life. God begins to reveal by the Holy Spirit what has gone on or what's happening behind the scenes. And, and then as we do that, God begins to show you. He opens your spiritual eyes and your ears to see and to hear what's going on. And now your prayers can be more effective. And this is why the Bible says to watch as well as pray. Because as we, we, we pray in the Spirit, we begin to discern what's going on. And God begins to show us by the Holy Spirit. And then we can more effectively pray. You guys understand that? Amen. All right. So um, the Holy Spirit prays for us through us according to God's will as we just read there in um, Romans chapter 8 verses 27 through 28. All right, so these are things that the Holy Spirit does. Um, he convicts of sin, righteous, of sin, and he convinces us of righteousness and of the judgment that is, you know, uh, taking place. Um, so all of these things help us to be convinced of who we are in Christ Jesus um, so that we get rid of some of the old ways that we've thought about. Um, and this is what that word reprove again means. And so the Holy Spirit is over and over again. Um, he's convincing us. Every time you hear the word, every time you come to church um, on, on Wednesday nights, which uh, uh, we'll be starting back up on this Wednesday on site, um, but every time that you hear the word and you see the word, the Holy Spirit, more and more, he begins to convince you of the things and the realities that uh, God has for us through Jesus Christ. And so, um, in conclusion, <laughs> the Holy Spirit uh, continues to work in us and he works on us that he may work through us. And if you're out there today and you are, maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, um, the first thing that God wants to do in, in your life is to help you to understand that if you continue down that pathway that you're on in your life right now, see, that there is a, the Bible says that it, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. And so it takes a person understanding that, you, you, know, you know, sometimes we, we say that I'm a, a morally good person or that, you know, I do certain things. We, we try to justify our status in heaven based on some of the things that we do here on the earth. But the Bible says that salvation does not come based on works. It says that it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, all of us can have different things that we say that we have done. All of us have done good things at some point in our lives. But no matter how good we have been and what we have done, there is nothing that can cause us to be good enough to stand before God and say that you can accept me into heaven. There is only one thing, and that is the blood of Jesus. And so... If you're out there and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior or if you're in this house or maybe you knew Jesus at some point and maybe you turned away from him. I believe right now that the Holy Spirit is working on you because God loves you. And God doesn't want any sinner to uh, perish. And this is why God sent his son so that all of us would have the opportunity to know how much God loves them so that all of us would have the opportunity to, to be able to receive Jesus. And this is why the Bible says that when the gospel has been preached to all the earth, then the end will come. God wants every person out there in every remote place and thank God for the technology that is available that is enabling 
uh, you know, the, the word to be preached all around the world, world translated into many uh, uh, different languages remote, uh, of remote people, deep into the jungles and all of the places around the world. And so God wants every person to have the opportunity in every generation to know that Jesus loves them. And without Jesus, no person is good enough to get into heaven. And so if you're out there and you don't know Jesus, you may say, I'm good, but guess what? I'm telling you that you're not good enough. It doesn't matter what your social status is or your financial status is. You could be the wealthiest person financially in all the world. But none of it can pay your way into heaven. We have an account in the Bible where there was a rich man and there was a beggar. And the rich man, he had a lavish life. He lived it up. He thought he had it made. And Jesus gives this account. He wasn't given a, a story about an occurrence. He was given an, a, an actual account to let us know that there is life on the other side and that you have a choice in where you spend eternity. This is why we preach the word. This is why we stand before you. This is why God sends so many people across your path so that you will understand that there is only one way into heaven and his name is Jesus. And so this rich man thought he had it made and he looked down on the poor man that begged. And the Bible says that they both went into the other side of life and the rich man lifted up his eyes in the torment of the flame of the pit of hell. And he looked and he saw the other, the poor man who was not in torment, who was not in the pits of hell and Abraham said you had your opportunity when you were on the earth I'm putting it in my own words now he said you had your opportunity and you rejected how many people does God have to send your way for you to understand and to get the message and thank God, I believe that somebody is praying for you in your life. See, the Bible talks about in John chapter 6 that the Father draws those to him. Because God wants you in the kingdom. And so he sends people across your path and somebody is praying for you that your heart will be softened so that you will receive the word of God that is being spoken unto you. Some people say, well, I'm so young, I, got, I have time. Well, how many people do we see that expire before they get to an older age? Some calamity happens or something suddenly happens that they did not anticipate and they thought that they had more time. So my message is to you today. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you right now. I know that you feel those nudgings that are taking place in your heart right now. The Holy Spirit is doing his job right now not to condemn you, but to let you know that if you continue down the path that you're going, it is not going to be well for you. God loves you, and he sent his son for you to die for you so that you would be able to receive God's best for you. And so that one day, we don't all know how much longer we have on the scene. Jesus could come back at any moment. And if he doesn't come back, your day could be up. 
And we want to make sure that before either of those moments happen, that you know Jesus personally. I know so many people, and I was talking with someone yesterday, they were sharing about somebody that goes to church and they, you know, they, you know they, someone talks to them about the Lord, but they say, well, I go to church. You know, my parents do such and such in the church, but they live a life that is contrary. They have not come to a personal relationship with the Lord. So this is all that I'm saying to you today. There are some of you that are watching out there and you have not come into a personal relationship with the Lord. And so I know that the Lord is speaking to you right now. The Holy Spirit is working on your heart. And so I want you to pray this prayer with me. And give in to the promptings of the Lord in your life right now. God loves you so much. I want you to say these words after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. You said in your word that if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. So I confess Jesus as my Lord. I believe that you died for my sins and that you were raised from the dead. I thank you for saving me now in Jesus' name. So if you just prayed that prayer, thank you for coming into the kingdom of God. Thank you for allowing the Lord to do in your life what he has seen throughout the ages and what he has wanted to do. And so now I encourage you that as the Lord has brought you into his kingdom, let us know on the same page of where you're viewing. Let us know that you just prayed that prayer. I want to reach out to you to share some more information that you will begin to grow in this newfound walk with the Lord so that you will understand the things that God has now has for you through Jesus Christ. And it's great. I promise you, it's great. It's wonderful. God loves you. And let me now say this over you. Father, we thank you for these lives that have committed themselves to you right now. Thank you, Father, for your love that is shed abroad in their hearts right now. And I thank you, Father, for forgiving them of all of their sins and all of the things that they have done wrong in their lives. Thank you, Father, for welcoming them into your kingdom right now and for the blood of Jesus that is covering them that has blotted out all of the things that were written against them. I thank you, Father, that you will continue to send people into their lives that will speak a word of encouragement, that will speak a now word from you, that will confirm, Father, the decision that they have made on this day. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, that if there are any that are too far away to come to this church, that you will direct them to a good Bible preaching and teaching church where your presence, your power, and your word is at. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for continuing to reveal yourself to them that they may continue to know every day how much you love them. We thank you for it, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Well, if you're out there also and you are looking for a church home, this is a wonderful place where God's, as you heard me say, his name is here, his presence is here, his power is here to save, heal, and to deliver. His word is here. 
And guess who else is here? The people of God are here. And so we invite you to become a part of this place. As the Bible says, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There are some out there who think it's just okay to, to watch through live stream. And, and, and this is a great means. In fact, you would not be able to watch us or learn anything of what you heard today without this. But God wants you also to be in a place where you can be with other believers. There is an edification that takes place when you're around other believers. There is a, 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 an inspiration that, that does not happen by just sitting at home. There are great things that come through the screen, so don't get me wrong, okay? And if that's the best that you can do, then I encourage you to continue to do that. But you know if you're just being complacent, you know if you're just being, um, I don't want to use that L word, <laughs> lazy, <laughs> All right. You know if you can do better. And that's between you and the Lord. But because it is between you and the Lord, you better make sure that you're making it good with the Lord. So if you're out there, don't just say, oh, the Lord knows my heart and, you know, and all of that stuff. He sure does. The Bible says this, that God knows our hearts, and this is why the preaching and the teaching of the word goes forth, so that there is a transformation that takes place in our hearts continually. So God doesn't want you just sitting at home. He doesn't just want you viewing us through live stream. And again, if that's the best that you can do, continue to do that. But God also wants you to be in a place assembling together, rubbing elbows with other believers. And this is where you're going to see even greater dynamics and dimensions of God in your life. And let me also say this. God has much work to do. And in order to do that, you have to be in a place where you can do it from. You can't do that work by just sitting at home or just by sharing posts on Facebook. All of those things are great, okay, and so on. But God, want, God has not designed it so that every man is an island or a franchise to him or herself. God wants you hooked in to a vision. There are prophetic, there are apostolic voices and anointings that you need to be hooked to. And this is what helps to keep you covered, keep you from being deceived, keep you in a place where God can build more things and reveal more things into your life. Sometimes we don't like to be submitted, and so we like to do our own thing out there. And we're good with just watching and listening and hearing the word, so now we can take what we heard and we can preach it to others. Second hand. <laughs> and so God wants you hooked in, submitted. The gifts that are on the inside of you will really flourish when you submit them to the Lord and to the leaders that God has in the body of Christ. So I encourage you. You're out there. <laughs> I know I got on you a little bit, <laughs> but the Lord loves you. And it's time for the body of Christ, for the church of God to advance. And the only way that we're going to advance is by being together and not all of these separate entities all over the place. But we have to be hooked in and tied in. So if you're in this Fredericksburg region, anywhere in the state of Virginia, I encourage you to look us up, get hooked into the vision of this house. And God will tremendously bless you and your family and all that you come into contact with. Amen? Amen. Well, if you have any prayer requests, uh, please submit them to us at, um, on our site. And you're watching us, and there's some uh, contact us information there. You can leave prayer requests and all of those good things. 
let us know. And we want to pray for you and with you and, uh, and uh, believe God for the things that you have need of in your life so that God's power will uh, change things in your life. Well, I'm going to ask everyone to stand. We're going to pray over all our tithes and our offerings. And those of you that are out there, we want to pray with you. And uh, we encourage you to continue to allow the Lord to direct you as to um, how and what you give into this ministry. It is good kingdom ground, and your seed will flourish. And, uh, and we believe God will bring, uh, multiply your seed and bring a harvest into your life. So... Um, Believe God for greater. The farmer puts his seed into the ground because he's expecting a harvest. So what are you expecting God to do in your life? Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we thank you for this opportunity and the time to worship you with all our tithes and our offerings. Thank you for the increase that you brought into our lives, for the doors of favor that opened up finances to us, that, that closed uh, doors of debt in our lives, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name for your faithfulness concerning us and that we, we live under an open heaven. We obey your word, Father, and bring all the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse that there might be meat in your house. And we thank you, Father, that even as we present all our tithes and offerings before the Lord Jesus as our faithful high priest, we thank you that, that, that you live forever that the work is finished, it's done. And so we thank you that even right now, as we worship you with our tithes and our offerings, that blessings are being spoken over our lives, that financial blessings are, are being spoken concerning us. New business deals, new opportunities, new promotions on our jobs, new increases and doors of wealth are open to us. And so we thank you for it right now in Jesus' name that even angels are moving and hearkening to the voice of your word right now on our behalf. And so we thank you, Father, for canceling debt. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for continuing to provide the stimulus from heaven for our lives. And we give you praise for it, and we give you honor in Jesus' name. We know, Father, that first the natural and then the spiritual. And so we thank you for heaven's stimulus for our lives. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory for it all in Jesus' mighty name. All in agreement with they say amen. 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 All righty, well, those of you that are out there uh, watching us through live stream land, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in um, on this Wednesday. And for those of you that are here in the house, if you, as you heard me say, we will be back on site this Wednesday at 7 p.m. So if you're in the area, you want a really dynamic uh, teaching, Apostle Rock will, and Apostle Ella, uh, one of them will be, be bringing the word of God. If you have uh, children, uh, youth, uh, you can bring them as well as we will have our children and youth classes as well on Wednesday nights. So uh, please make sure that um, you take advantage of these opportunities in a COVID-free environment, okay? And, um, and, and God's uh, power is all over this house and all over these grounds and, and, and all over these surfaces, all over the air, okay? <laughs> all right? As well as ushers and leaders here that constantly are, are sanitizing the air as well. So we're doing all the natural things. We're doing all the spiritual things to make sure that all is well when you come here at FCCWO. Amen? All right. Well, on the behalf of our apostles, Chastine and Ella Rock, on the behalf of my wife, Kimberly Rock, and myself, Pastor Milton, we are FCCWO Church. All right. We say God bless you. We'll see you next time. Have a great week.